Okay. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for your dual abilities to run the sound and Skype when necessary. All right, let's, uh, we are in um, Genesis. And we are in Genesis chapter 16, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, last class, we started on verse 6. And so I want to I reread that. Uh, and it's just um, the scripture and then uh, one paragraph, <clears throat> which is my tenor the way that I normally do anyway, so that um, we can make sure that we're in the flow of where I left off. So I'll do that, <clears throat> and then we'll get into the rest of what we have to say. This is verse 6, Genesis, <clears throat> excusez-moi, 16. But Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly, meaning oppressively, with her, she fled from her face. <clears throat> and then the paragraph that we ended with last time that I probably just read, since, it, since at this point there's only one supposed heir, Ishmael, all centers around Hagar and the apparent baby of promise. Sarah is jealous that Hagar could do what she could not and gets an attitude toward her by turning the tables and accuses Hagar of despising her as the real issue. That's verse 5. In verse 5, Sarah takes the blame. Does this sound like a soap opera to you? <laughs> Even as I'm reading, I'm going... I feel like a narrator on the TV. And then the scene opens with, you know. <laughs> in, in verse 5, Sarah takes the blame for allowing them to join. My bad is the way I put it. And is using nice wording to tell Abram to make a choice of which woman he will be with. Abram called Hagar your maid instead of my wife and puts the situation back in Sarah's hands. But she deals overly harsh with Hagar, who then runs away from what she may perceive as an untenable living situation. <clears throat> All right, so um, so this is this <clears throat> this situation. If you if you just read casually chapter sixteen in this part here, uh, and the verses in front, and some of them behind you would not perceive this to be that drastic of a thing. But it is. It is. Uh, it isn't, to, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it was really rough on Sarah because she, she didn't have the baby. Hagar did. I'm sure it was rough on Hagar. I'm sure it was rough on Abraham. But this situation was way worse to God than you could ever imagine. It took me by surprise as I was preparing, you know, not tonight, but this whole thing on Abraham, <clears throat> to see the magnitude of this thing. And it all deals with dealing oppressively with one another um, or whoever. Maybe not everybody, but just doing that. And um, <clears throat> so uh, let me just read on here. But we're going to be in this, this part of the chapter. Or, well, we'll be in this chapter. And in this chapter is dealing with this, the, the, the residue, bad word, uh, the blowout of, the, of all the this has caused <clears throat> all the way to, to the end until at the end of the chapter, finally Ishmael is born, but that's not, that doesn't seem to be, you know, the big deal. <clears throat> so I wrote this. Of, of course, the real issue is not Hagar, her baby, or the living situation. The real issue is Sarah's inability to bring forth the seed that God wanted out of her, both physically and spiritually. All right, both 
physically and spiritually, why couldn't she bring it forth spiritually uh, or physically? Because spiritually she was out of tune. Hmm, spirit, soul, and body, first spirit, then flows down to your soul, and then manifests in your body, amen? <clears throat> and I, I see Jim shaking his head because you taught spirit, soul, and body quite a few times. So. <laughs> and thank you for doing that, brother. Um, so I'm just going to read that sentence again. The real issue is Sarah's inability. It's her inability to bring forth the seed, and in this case I have it capitalized, that God wanted out of her, both physically and spiritually. All right, when you say inability, when you say inability, we say, well, I, just, I can't do that. I just can't do that. I can't, you know, when somebody does this to me, that I just can't, you know, just I can't just take it, or I can't just be nice, or I can't, you know. Um, but in this situation, God is dealing with this family according to the seed. This is God's focus and reason to even be messing with this family is his son. Okay. So um, he is, you see, I mean, Abraham's not going to be able to bring forth the seed other than spiritually, which, which he did in a major way, ultimately, down to 22. Um, but she was the one that was supposed to bring it forth physically, and to do that, God calls upon us not just to, okay, just do a physical act and it pleases me. See, we're, we're deceived if we think that's the deal. Well, uh, let's just be in a ministry and just do all kind of good little goodies for the kingdom. <laughs> goodies for the kingdom, you know. And uh, Lord, help us. That's not it. It can't just be running around picking the best fruit off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and calling that of God. <clears throat> it comes down first and foremost to what he's trying to do in us. He's trying to, and see, this applies to all of us because he's trying to bring forth the seed in all of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is, you know, we wonder why he would, you know, and we haven't even seen what, you know, his reaction ultimately is going to be here yet, but we will. And we, we would see it, and we would go, well, well, why would it be such a, why would this little situation, why is not little to God? Stop it. Stop looking as men. You know, what, what does Paul say? Nice little scripture, quit ye as men. You know, mankind. Um, we, we have to, you know, I mean, we don't have to, but, but the, the heart uh, of man should be, to know the Lord, to know him, not just because he's our creator, but because he is meant to be our life if we're born again. Um, we have every excuse in the world for the things that we do and say. <clears throat> but, you know, if you could... And Matt, can I have a bite of that cereal? Is that what that is? <laughs> okay, so there's no fruit going to come from you. Is that right? Is that <laughs> I had no. Okay. Um, so in Sarah's case, there was no fruit. And Marcus, no fruit. She's not going to bring forth fruit to others. <laughs> okay. Oh, I get it. Okay. Now, you do know that these things are being recorded, and they'll go down in history, and your name will be written in the annals of... I, I keep hoping you jump up and go bring me... <laughs> Never mind. I'm teasing you. I, look at it. That's perfect. <laughs> um, so, 
Sarah's inability to bring forth the seed. The, does God look at us like we're Sarah? Where's the, you know, where's the seed? All I see is your inability to bring forth that seed. Now, we've been making it plain and always need to, uh, to some degree, fortify what we're saying with the reality that if you're in Christ, then the hope is, but that's, that's the, you know, it's Christ in you, the hope. <laughs> you know, you are in Christ. You are stable. You have that. But that doesn't guarantee that you're going to bring forth the Son. There is a heart situation. S seek the Lord while he may be found, the scriptures say. Stuff like that, and, you know. Um, um, there, there comes a time and a place after, you know, that you go, you know, you get stable, and then you go, you know what? I'm stable. There is stability in him. I am rooted in him. It says that in Colossians. Rooted in him. Instead of just walking around satisfied that I'm going to be okay, and this is what Paul does. He begins to think of the Lord's heart. He begins to go, you know, you know, all this is mine and I'm just living, you know. So I want the seed to come out of me. You know, with all the blessings, with all the stability, with all the things that you've done, Lord, I can't live this way only anymore. I want you to get what you want out of it, which is the fruit, right? Which is the fruit. So, um, <clears throat> uh, when we are the problem but we are blaming others, the worst thing another person can do is give us the authority and power to oversee the situation. Did you all understand what that said? Let me say it again. <laughs> when we are the problem and we are blaming others as if they're the problem, the worst thing another person could do is give us the authority and power to oversee the situation. Because it's going to end badly right you know it's it's better to go you know what I don't think so I'm not really have you, I mean I'm sure many of you if not all of you at some juncture have probably been in a situation where something happened well let me just use me as an example of this sometimes things happen and I'm, I don't immediately just go, yes, I'm with Jesus, woo, woo you know, blah, you know. Uh, sometimes I need a little bit of time, and usually that time needs to be away from people, <laughs> lest I throw up on them, you know what I'm saying. And so I try to measure those things in myself and go, you know what, I, you know, I need to be with the Lord. One of the things I love about sharing the word of God is I, I, I walk in fear and trembling of standing up in front of people and my spirit not being right. That's just not, that's, that, I don't want to do that. I want to be right with the Lord, you know. So the advantage of teaching is that it's constantly making me go, you know, I got to get right here, you know. <laughs> You're going... Okay, so you go through something, you go, oh, no, I got this class tonight. And then you go, i got to get right, so you get right. And then the next morning something happens, you go, oh, i got this, I've got this <laughs> class on Wednesday, and i got to get right, you know. And then something else happens, you go, Thursday, oh, no, i got to get right. And now I'm sharing on Sunday, oh, no. So probably the, the best way is to stay right as much as you can. But. You know, if I'm off, um, and I think, you know, hopefully I'm sort of past this, but if I'm really off in my spirit and say Jim asks me, comes and says, well, will you lead worship or will you share or something like that um, on Sunday morning? <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to bring a wrong spirit. <clears throat> The, I've said this often, but there are things 
that you will do for others that maybe you wouldn't have done for yourself. But when others are involved, then you go, I'm gonna, I gotta do this. You know, I think mothers know that real well with their kids. You know, you persevere, you go, this is not for me, this is for others. You take the loss, you do this, this sort of thing. And um, so anyway, let me just say this. It could appear that Abram made a horrible mistake by doing it the way he did it and told her, well, she's in your hand, you take care of it. But I don't believe it was a mistake. The, the results of this thing are catastrophic throughout the ages. But I don't believe it was a mistake. See, and this is one of the deals that we don't understand, and that is we think that the goal is to be with God so that every situation, you know, turns out with rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> you know, and, and fluffy clouds and butterflies. Yeah, that's right, Jim. You got it. <laughs> that are reaching down their ominous hand to get Chris. Look at this thing. <laughs> Um, what was I even talking about? What? Well, and we really do. We want, we think that it's the Lord. When something gets off or something, we think, especially if you're in leadership, you think, well, the first thing that I need to do is go fix that. And I learned years ago that just fixing everything wasn't necessarily God's will that there's so many examples throughout the scriptures. I mean, you know, without those rainbow glasses, try reading the book of Acts and just going through and say, okay, I'm gonna look to see if they ever had any problems and you will be shocked. Because I remember when that change came because I would read Acts and I'd go, oh man, I wish it was like Acts. I want it to be like Acts for all of us. Yeah, man, it was so cool, all this stuff. And one day I opened it and the Lord said, now read this with the problems. And I went, holy moly, these are, this is a lot of stuff, you know? A lot of really negative stuff. Well, God doesn't just, it's gone. You know, I wouldn't want you to go through anything, you know? <clears throat> His goal is not to make life wonderful on the earth. If it was wonderful, we would go, somebody would say, well, Jesus could come back today, and we say, well, I hope not. Everything's great. <laughs> right? You know? Why, why do that? He's, he's got it pretty good down here right now. <clears throat> That's not his goal. His goal is to form his son in his... And, you know, sometimes it's important that we see the garbage that's inside of us. It's not fun, but it's necessary. And so, you know, uh, instead of him being a garbage man that comes by every week and picks up your garbage, sometimes he throws it on your front porch <laughs> or in your face. So... <clears throat> You know, I, I'm just telling you, everyone may not agree with that or on Skype or people that watch this later, but I am telling you that I had to learn a lesson. And, and I, I pray over each situation that I'm supposed to deal with or whatever uh, and find out, Lord, is this one that you want me to do something? To, you know, and, and if so, what? Uh, or let it go. Because I've seen people, <clears throat> I have seen people that were just, they were just, they got upset, you know, with me or the church or this or that, and they're just upset. And they go home and they're upset. And you're just, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I need to call them and, you know, tell them, you know, well, whatever, you know, soothe it over. <clears throat> and the Lord started saying, uh, no, let them boil in their own juices for a while. Isn't 
in there, aren't they going to, you know, in there be in boil in there long enough? They're going to come out as some hairless monster, <laughs> or something. <coughs> maybe, but they maybe it's the time to show them what they are, and they may have, may they may leave and have to live with that the rest of their life because they never turned or they never got with the Lord over it or they only stood for their own rights or they only saw what someone else did wrong. Sarah saw what Hagar did wrong. That's how the whole thing started. God's not going, you know, Hagar, you need to be right. You're going to bring forth the seed. Oh, sorry, you're not. But Sarah, you're supposed to. So, you know, so what does it take then as a leader when you see these things? Well, one thing it takes is not be the leader. Let, let Jesus be Lord. No, I'm serious. In a real way. We, everybody says Jesus is Lord, but how much is he really the leader in our lives? How much do we even check in with him, you know? <clears throat> but you get in these situations and you realize it affects lives and it's going to, you know, da 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 da. And if you hear from God and you're with God and you carefully ask Him, well, what should I do or not do? How much, how little, whatever. And He gives it to you and then you carry it out exactly as you heard it from God. If the whole thing blows up like this one does, you know that you were with God and that you didn't step out of bounds. Because, you know, whatever, you know, we can't have a church that's got problems or, you know, compassionate ministry or any of that stuff. I know that I have been with the Lord. <clears throat> and that, that means a lot over the years, you know. Like Paul talked about being before the Lord with a good conscience, you know. And, you know, you, you, no one's perfect. But if, you're, if you are endeavoring not to use your own mind, your own will, you want him and you want his direction, then like in a situation like this, who knows? Maybe Abraham heard from God and he says, Tell, give it all to her. And maybe Abraham prayed back and said, this can't go well. Are you sure? And maybe the Lord said, I don't, I shouldn't have to explain it all to you so that you will do it because you now you understand, but that you do it because you know my voice and you follow me. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> but those things take time. They do. They take time. And, you know, um, I've been at this for a long time. I mean, I graduated Bible school and was immediately put on the mission field and pastored several different churches and all kinds of situations. So it's like talk about boiling somebody in their juices. <laughs> the Lord put me in it. And uh, so I don't, I don't put expectations on everybody on everything that I teach. Y'all probably don't know that. You probably don't know that I don't put expectations on what I teach. In fact, there's a good chance that if I was showing somebody how to be with the Lord and then class was over and went into my office and heard something that was contrary to that, I just say, Lord, you know, I'm with you. What do you want? And he goes, they're young. Leave them alone. <laughs> You know, I mean, in other words, not being judgmental. Just be with the Lord. You know, it's just better. It's better for them. It's better for you. It's, if that's what the Lord wants, then it's better for the Lord. All right. Um, so I wrote the, in those red letters that I tend to do, unfair to Hagar. When, uh, so we have Genesis 16:6. 6. So this is unfair to Hagar. So when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. That's what the scripture says. So, all right. So this is unfair. Now, scripture doesn't say it's unfair. 
I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to put you in that situation so that you look at it and go, well, if I was in that situation and this person was doing that and they were just oppressively lording over me and da 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 and all this kind of stuff, you know, I think I would flee too. Um, well, we're going to find that God thinks differently. No, he's going he's gonna to deal with this totally different from what you, you and I would. <clears throat> so Hagar left with the child. Therefore, Sarah's harsh treatment put Abraham and Sarah back to where they were all along, no heir of God's promises. Because remember, that's what they, they assume, that this is the heir. <clears throat> and... I'm sure I've got it written in here, right, somewhere close. But Abraham thought this, thought that Ishmael was it, all the way to the point where God says, okay, now Sarah is going to literally bring forth. Now it's going to happen all these years, past 10 years, you know, because I think, I don't know, I don't know how many years. But all the way past that time, God says to Abraham, Sarah's finally going to do it. It's the time. Not those words. <laughs> Yay. Let us be happy. But Abraham's response is, oh, that Ishmael could live before you. Wow. You know, I mean, you look at, you know, Abraham, how long is it going to take you to get this? The point isn't how long. The point is, does he get it? The answer is, yes, yes he does. <laughs> the point isn't how long. The point is what happens in him eventually. And is God able to use all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are be called according to his purpose, which is to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8. So, um, that's, this is a long sentence here. Um, Hagar left with the child, therefore Sarah's harsh treatment put Abram and Sarah back to where they were all along. And that was no heir of God's promise, all because Sarah could not remain under humiliation, but had to express jealousy along with her rights. Okay. Um, Anybody ever read the book of Esther? Nobody ever read that thing? There's a guy in there named Mordecai. And Mordecai was mortified. Mordecai continually, uh, this, this really bad guy named Haman was put in charge. And so the king commanded that all of the king's servants bow when Haman goes by. Now there is nothing good about Haman. He's evil to the core. But the king's commandment, the king representing Christ, the king's commandment was you bow down. We don't understand that, do we? We say, well that can't be right. Well that's exactly the way Mordecai thinks. This can't be right. And the other servants are, are people, leaders come to him and say, why are you transgressing the king's commandment? They didn't say, why are you, you know, not bowing down to Haman? And he would say, because he's an evil guy and you guys are losers. You're all bowing down to him. You shouldn't be bowing down to him while I'm making a stand for God. And they're going, why are you transgressing the king's commandment? And the whole rest of the story up to chapter, what is it? I don't even remember anymore. Um, he's off still, you know, and, he, and all of his not bowing down has caused Haman to go into a rage. If he just did the king's commandment, this rage never would have happened, but he's bowing, not bowing down, and he goes into a rage, and then he says, well, we're going to kill all the Jews, which is whose fault? Haman's, because he said, no. If we are in, if we're in God's will, if we're following in His Spirit and His Word, then that situation would never happen. 
And everybody did it. All the Jews, all, everybody did it except one guy named Mordecai. And then what happens? Well, he, he, Mordecai hears that everybody's going to die just because he was not going to, I'm not going to obey the king's commandment, the Lord. I'm not going to, this guy's wrong and that would be wrong and I'm righteous and I'm doing the right thing. Uh, while I'm breaking God's word and transgressing him, you know, I'm doing the right thing because this is wrong. You're, you're eating off the wrong tree, Mordecai. You're not just eating off it. I think you sleep in that tree. Man, because everything he does. So when he finds out that everybody is going to die, all the Jews are going to die, he, he freaks out and he goes, he puts on sackcloth and ashes, really looking religious, and he goes down in the middle of the city and, and starts going, oh, you know, well, of course he is because everybody's going to be mad when they find out it's because of him they're all going to die. So he's down there trying to look spiritual. Oh, you know, oh, God, you know. And then he goes up to the king's gate in sackcloth and ashes and people come to, people come to Esther and say, uh, hey, Mordecai, is down there at the king's gate in sackcloth and ashes, and it's against the law, against the commandment of the king to do that. And Sarah's going, what the heck are you doing now? You know? Send someone down there and says, put on, take that off and put this on. Jesus doesn't want you doing that. <laughs> no, this is right. The prophets do this. You're not a prophet, dude. You're not even hardly of God at this stage. <laughs> the prophets always do it. it. It looks really cool, you know. <clears throat> Violating the king's commandment all the way through. And he represents the carnal mind until a certain juncture where the cross becomes what the thing that he stands for. We have a similar situation right here. We have Sarah, who Hagar, you know, gave her the evil eye when she looked at her or mocked her or whatever. You know, what, whatever. I mean, that doesn't change Christ in you. You don't see that and go, well, I can't go with you now, Lord. They did that. It's their fault. It's Haman's fault. It's Hagar's fault. It's somebody else's fault. They, they caused this horrible beast to rise in me. I didn't raise it up. I was peaceful. I was so with you until they did what they did. And I have to do this. I have to. I must do it. I must kill it. And that's that, you know, but y'all, anybody ever experienced something like that before? This side had really admitted it. Anybody over here? Ever? <laughs> <laughs> this side is going, yeah, we're, we're all in on that question. <laughs> but, you know, it's because our mind is not renewed. It's because we think that uh, to, to pull off all the good off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what is of God instead of the tree of life. We ignore the tree of life. And we just pull off of that. And we, we eat it and we say, well, look at that. Look at that animal over there. They're eating the evil part. I'm eating the good stuff. And somebody says, well, didn't he say we shouldn't eat anything off of it? Yeah, I'm only eating the good. <laughs> I'm good. They're evil. Hagar's evil. Haman's evil. I have to do this. I have to. <laughs> I'm standing up for what's good, what's just, what's right, that what violates the very nature of God himself that told me not to do it. 
Are y'all still glad you came tonight? <laughs> so, that's what we're dealing with. Now you're getting the picture. That's what we're dealing with with, with Sarah and Hagar. And God's not going to put up with it. But he's going to deal with it in a completely different way that will throw a wrench in this thing so bad you can't even imagine. <clears throat> so I'm trying to get through one paragraph here. <clears throat> uh, so the last part is um, Hagar leaves with the supposed child of promise all because Sarah could not remain under humiliation but had to express jealousy along with her rights. Can't remain under it. Can't remain. No, I can't do, I can't do this. It's too hard. I'm too righteous. They're too evil. Think of it. Think of it like that. I'm too righteous and they're too evil and I can't, you know, I am not, I am not going to put up with that stuff. This is unfair. See this little red right there? It says unfair unfair <laughs> because that's see you see it's unfair doesn't count how many of you remember where we don't go we don't don't ever go to the snot fair because <laughs> it's yucky and it's gooey and stuff like that we don't go to the snot fair yeah but it's not fair we don't go there now, that's funny, but it's, it's a good thing to remember. Guess where I got that from? That's what I used to teach my children when they were little. Right, Deb? I said, we don't go to the snot fair. That's where it came from. We go to the State Fair of Texas, but we don't go to the snot fair. Okay. Because the issue is not the issue. And the, and the issue here is it was unfair what Hagar did to me. What? You've got, the, you've got the Lamb of God in you. You've got the Christ crucified living in you, and you can't go with a little look, you know? Or, you know, this, this person is evil and wrong through and through, and you want me to bow down to them? No, I want you to bow down to the Lord and do what he asks you to do in relationship to them. That's all I ask. Can you be with me? I'm going to try. But I'm telling you, I'm going to explode. I'll let you make me do this. <laughs> okay. So. Wow. We'll just have to. Okay, so I'm going to read Genesis 16 now, 6 through 12, because we need to, um, we need to see the, the real plot. In these verses, I promise you, is the seeds of everything important that's going to start happening. And, and there's one vein that will take off and go and go and go throughout the whole Bible. Several veins, actually, but I'm just... All right, so here we go. <clears throat> Verse 6 through 12. But Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thine hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly or oppressively, oppressingly with her, she fled from her face. Okay. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to Shur. Okay, so Shur, however that's pronounced, S-H-U-R, is almost to the border now of Egypt. She's an Egyptian, right? So she's, yeah, she's heading home. <clears throat> so that the, the, um, the word Sarah dealt oppressively with her and she fled from her face the very next verse she's already almost to Egypt okay 
An angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her oppressive hands, under her hands. All right. Some time ago, weeks ago, I said to you, well, this situation was going to happen. And I said, we're going to need the lamb here. Who's going to be the lamb? Will it be Sarah? Will it be Hagar? Will it be God? Remember, many of we yelled out, it's going to be God. It's going to be, it's going to be Sarah. Nobody thought that it would be Hagar if she does this, if she does this, if she obeys the Lord, if she does it in the right spirit, this is going to change the course of everything. This is going to change the course of everything. It doesn't matter if Sarah is the wife of Abraham and da 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 da. It's going to change everything. So, um, submit thyself under her, under her hands. And I put oppressive there, under her oppressive hands, because that's what they're going to be. Okay? And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will, okay. See, this isn't random. He's not, I will multiply your seed. He's saying all this. This isn't random. This is the first thing he said was go submit yourself under her oppressive hands. And I will multiply your seed. I will. I think, and you can see it in the scriptures, I think he said to Abraham, uh, for sure in Genesis 22, every time he made that promise, but in Genesis 22, when the cross began to be the center for his son, God said, without a doubt, I will, in multiplying, I will multiply thee. I will, it's all based on the lamb. There is no increase based on, well, God really likes me because I'm special. You know, you're special, all right, but God doesn't really like that part, okay? <laughs> So it's based on the lamb. It's based on willing to, to uh, face humiliation, but in a right spirit. See, it's one thing to, to just submit yourself under humiliation without a right spirit is not, is not godly. It's, it's torture. Am I right or wrong? It would just be torture. It would be wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. God, God's not just into suffering and making people suffer and go, okay, well, that's good. You, you, you put up with that. Put up with it? No. Submit is a, is a yielding word. Right? It's a yielding word. It's not a, well, I'll stand hard, but I'll, I'll do what I'm asked. But, I, you know, that'd be like, that would be like, Mordecai bowing down, but going, you know, I hate this and I hate that guy, and you know, I'm doing this, but God told me to, but I'm, you know, you know, I'm only doing it because He told me to. Well, you miss the whole spirit of the thing. You don't understand it at all, and get up, you know, and go rush at him with a knife. See what happens, you, you know, <laughs> you know, might as well, you know, because that's what you are on the inside. Might as well manifest it if you're not going to let that spirit be in you, then, you know, see, most people say, well, you don't, you don't want to, you know, just manifest it. You need to see what you are. You need to see it to the depths. You need to know that this is absolutely the very opposite of the Lamb of God. And, and this is, this is you. This is you. The discovery comes. You are Haman. You're his twin brother. 
fighting with your brother. You know, in that sense, you understand what I'm saying when I say that, right? I mean, you're just, you know, you're you're the same spirit. You know, Haman got upset and go, well, I'm going to do this and I'll, I'll make him suffer. But no, I'll, I'll kill everybody that's ever related to him. Well, on the inside, Mordecai's going, I don't want to submit to you and I won't, you know, I'm not going to, you know, do this and whatever. And he may not be saying, well, I'll kill everybody, but they all do die <laughs> when it's all said and done. So, it, so this, is, this is all important stuff here. So in verse 10, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. This is talking to Hagar, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child. See, she knew that she was pregnant. Thou art with child and shall bear a son. It could have been a girl before this time. But we got, we got some stuff for Sarah to have to deal with now. You know, this is, she bought it. She paid for it, okay? Um, um, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Ishmael means what? He hears, he heard your affliction, he heard your cries, he heard, he hears. And I'll tell you, and I'll bring this up several times as we go through this. Every time God hears the name Ishmael, Ishmael it's not a bad name. The person may be, and the person may end up being, surely will in, in the scriptures even here. But the name was given in the purest form from the heart of God because that's the way he is. And we'll see this more and more. We're just, we're just setting the stage here right now. But God named Ishmael. God named him. I want everybody to know this is God. I want everybody to know that I hear the oppressed and I'm no respecter of persons when it comes to oppression. And if that's what you're going to be, you're going to you're going to pay for it, and so will your seed the rest of their lives too. Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son; and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy oppression. Not, I'm just going to call his name Ishmael, because. I heard him crying because, you know, he was thirsty and, you know, they weren't quite to Egypt. Because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. What affliction? Sarah. Sarah. Because she was, you know, we're, I'm jumping ahead, but, you know, we need to at least say some of these things. The angel of the Lord, one of the first things he says is, where are you, where are you going? Where are you going? You, you belong back over here. Your place in the plan is over here. Your place is going to require that you handle humiliation in a right spirit. But, there's, but if you cry out to me, then I will answer that, but I will... I won't change the fact that this is where you're going to have to, you have to go, you have to be under this. You have to learn. You have to be with me. If you want anything for Ishmael and your seed, you need to bow down your heart and do it because you're with me. Is this incredible or what? And then verse 12, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So all that right there in the end is just powerful. And it's also payback. It's payback. And it's going to be payback for all generations. We wonder why there's this. Because a woman couldn't take humiliation for a while. Couldn't be with the Lord in it. 
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your heart uh, that you want your son in us. You don't just want us to bear humiliation. You don't just want us to suffer. You want your son. And you love us enough um, because we've asked, Lord, we say we want your son. But Father, help us to understand. Help us to understand the spirit of what you're asking for and not just the thing or the event. Help us to grasp your heart. Help us to grasp the issues of your heart, which are very different than the issues of our heart. And help us love you as the Lamb of God forever and ever and ever and call you beautiful. Slaughtered lamb upon the throne. Worthy, worthy, worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.